Well, hello everybody and uh, welcome to the first Thinking Big Talk of the Year. It's lovely to see you all, those of you here in person and uh, those of you who are joining us online. So, my title for my talk is uh, The Hidden Life of Trees, which I have taken shamelessly from this great book uh, by Peter, Peter Vollleben, who is a German forester. It's an absolutely fascinating book, I can really recommend it. Uh, it's in the school library, or at least it will be in the school library when I return it. Um, not to be mistaken with this book, The Secret Life of Trees, but as you can tell from the, the two very similar titles, there's, there's something going on here. There's more to trees than meets the eye. Now, before I go any further, just feel that I ought to deal with a couple of questions that may be running through your mind. The first one is, why am I, an English teacher, giving a talk about trees? Um, I am no expert. I am certainly, uh, I'm not a scientist, so I'm speaking today as uh, an enthusiast. I'm speaking as a, a fellow student. Um, but I love trees, and I've loved trees for years, so I want to share something of my uh, enthusiasm for trees. And this takes us right to the heart of what we're trying to do in these Thinking Big talks. Uh, when we first set them up a few years ago, we were very keen that we broke through subject boundaries. Um, and we had teachers initially, and then students as well, talking about a whole range of topics just because they were enthusiastic about them. If there's one word which encapsulates these talks for me, it's, it's wonder. We want people to recover that enthusiasm of youth, that sense of wonder at the world. And so actually talking about things that are, are not what we're teaching for A-level is quite important here. There's a second question that may be running through your mind, and if it isn't, perhaps it should be, which is, what is a tree? And like most simple questions, it's actually very difficult to answer. So we might think that a tree is, it's got a trunk, it's got leaves, it has some sort of um, seed, um, but that's only going to get us so far. So is this a tree? Is this a tree? Well, it's got a trunk, but the trunk is not made of wood. Uh, the trunk here is made of stalks, primarily, anyway, stalks from the leaves. Um, and the strength of that trunk comes in part largely from water pressure, in much the way that a cabbage stalk uh, gains its strength. So this is really a banana plant rather than a banana tree. Botanically speaking, this is a giant herb. But I want to suggest to you today that actually uh, there, is, there is more going on to trees than the trunk, the leaves, uh, the fruits. And in particular, I want us to think about uh, something which is, which is hidden. And I think the best way I can do that is by showing you this picture. Now, a bit of audience participation here, please, everybody. What is this? On. Trees. Thank you, Anna. I can always rely on you. Wrong answer. Anyone else want to have a go? A picture, a photograph of trees. Very clever, very clever. Not quite what I was looking for. This is a tree. This is a quaking aspen. Um, it's from Utah uh, in the States. And the remarkable thing about the quaking aspen is that the roots... Um, what was going underground provides all sorts of subsidiary shoots. In this case, 40,000 of them. This particular quaking aspen has 40,000 trunks, spreads over 100 acres. This is one tree. So what's going on underneath the ground is at least as significant as what is going on above the ground. Now, there are all sorts of implications to this. Once we start thinking about the tree's roots, rather than thinking about it simply in terms of what we can see, all sorts of other issues start to hove into view. And one of them um, is to do with the ageing of trees. Now, there's a problem here. How do you age a tree? How do you date a tree? How do you know how old it is? You count the rings. You count the rings. Okay, you count the rings. Um, the problem with that, well, there's two problems with that. One problem is that often very old trees go hollow, or at least go partially hollow, so it becomes very difficult to count the rings. The second problem is that in order to count those rings, you've got to cut it down, um, and this can be problematic. Though I discovered just yesterday that in 1964, uh, one of the oldest trees in the world, in the States, 
uh, was chopped down by a scientist who was doing some research. An absolute scandal. This thing was 5,000 years old. Um, so scientists more recently have started to think uh, a little bit more laterally, and they've been doing radiocarbon dating on the roots of the trees, because the roots are often, uh, well, are the, the, the oldest part of those trees. So this tree, which doesn't look that impressive, to be, to be perfectly frank, is 1,230 years old. It's a Heldreich pine uh, from, from Italy. Uh, remarkable thing. And we only find that out by looking at the roots. Um, this tree is possibly the oldest tree in Britain. It's the Fortingall Yew um, in Scotland. Um, it's older than Scotland, probably. But we're not quite sure how old exactly this tree is. Partly because uh, yew trees often really do go uh, hollow. And the heartwood starts to rot away. And then new wood grows on top of the old wood. So yews literally renew themselves from the outside in. And therefore it becomes very difficult to, 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 to age them uh, by conventional means. And radiocarbon dating hasn't been done on this one. So all sorts of different ages have been suggested for it. 3,000 years, um, I've seen 5,000 plus years as a possibility. Nobody quite knows. It's an absolutely remarkable tree. And rather sadly, I think, it's been walled in. You can't get right up to it. You can't touch it. Um, I think that's also slightly foolish because trees don't tend to respond to being walled in. They burst through the boundaries we place upon them. So uh, thinking about the age of trees, I think, is, is rather interesting. But we need to go further than that. And I, I want to ask another question of you, uh, which is, what is the largest living organism on Earth? Shout out and answer, somebody. Blue whale. Blue whale, OK. Let's try the blue whale. OK, blue whale is the wrong answer. No, the right answer is this is the largest living organism on Earth. Not the tree, the fungus. It's a honey fungus. And this one is from uh, the Blue Mountains in Oregon. And uh, it stretches at least 2.4 miles wide over a, an area of 3.7 square miles. It is quite incredible. It has been called by more than one journalist a humongous fungus. Um, so here we go, this, this humongous fungus. Now what's going on with this humongous fungus? Well this humongous fungus is really rather important because what it's doing is it's linking the roots of different trees. We tend to think of trees as solitary beings, but actually they are interconnected. They are a community. They work best when they are working together. And so this interconnection going on under the surface where the roots are connected by the fungi uh, has been, fairly predictably, uh, christened the Wood Wide Web. Now, what's going on with this Wood Wide Web? Well, this is what's going on. There's a transfer of carbon through the fungi between different trees, partly between um, trees of the same species. So it's one way in which the mother tree feeds the younger trees. Okay, so trees get their food primarily through photosynthesis, through the leaves, but they can also get nutrients through the fungi, through the soil as well. Um, and the mother tree can feed the younger trees. But also, remarkably, uh, trees can work in cooperation with other species as well. So there is a transfer of nutrients, transfer of carbon, between different types of tree. Peter Volleben in uh, The Hidden Life of Trees talks about a stump of a tree in the forest that he manages, which has been dead, this tree has been dead, apparently, for a very, very long time, hundreds and hundreds of years. And yet when he examined it closely, he realised it was still alive. Now, how is this possible? How can a stump of a tree, a tree that's been chopped down, has no leaves whatsoever, still be alive? Well, the answer is it's being fed by its neighbours. It's being looked after by other trees through the root system, through the fungi. Absolutely remarkable. There's more to it than meets the eye, even than that. What also is going on is that there are 
there is communication going on. Trees can talk to each other. I'll send out a link afterwards to a very short video, a very good video, uh, which is called How Trees Secretly Talk to Each Other. And uh, the best way of illustrating this is by looking at this um, acacia tree from Africa. Beautiful tree, wonderful tree, but this poor tree has a problem, and this is the problem. Giraffes love acacia leaves. So how does this tree survive? Because it could be very easily, or these trees could be very easily stripped bare of their leaves uh, within minutes. Well, the answer is that as soon as the giraffe starts to munch on the leaves, the tree sends up toxins into those leaves to make them unpalatable to the giraffe. And so the giraffe moves on. But more than that, the tree then warns other acacia trees that this predator is in the area. And one of the ways it does this is by releasing uh, a gas, ethylene, which then drifts downwind to other trees who start pumping toxins into their own leaves as well. Uh, it's, it's quite remarkable. And so what the giraffes do is either move on a very long way or they move upwind. And so both of them benefit. The giraffes still get to munch away, they still get to survive, um, but the acacia trees don't get stripped uh, completely bare. So trees, there's a lot more to trees than meets the eye. They are able to communicate according to Peter Volleben, they're able to feel um, and they're able to send out warning signals to each other. But we might want to think about the hidden life of trees in, in other ways as well. So um, I think the best way of illustrating this is through this book, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, which is a, a, a great novel. It's not a novel actually about trees, it's a novel about um, an immigrant family in America and their travails. But the central metaphor of the book is a particular tree, the one you can see uh, on the book cover there. And this tree is the tree of heaven. It's one of my favourite trees. And I first came across the tree of heaven in Cambridge. There's a, um, a hotel called the University Arms Hotel. And there's a tree of heaven growing out of one of its walls. And every year this hotel would hack away at this tree trying to get rid of it. And uh, every year the, the tree would, would fight back, it would grow back. And if you'll excuse the um, very poor Mr. Hargreaves-esque pun, I was always rooting for this tree. I was on the side of the underdog. But in this country and in Europe and in America, the tree of heaven is often regarded as a pest, as an invasive species. Another name for it is the stinking tree. So if you crush the, uh, the leaves of the male tree, it produces this appalling smell. Uh, it's also known as the spring tree because it has a very long period of dormancy over the winter. Uh, and so when eventually it comes into bloom again, you know that spring really has arrived. But people try and get rid of it. People try and get rid of it. They see it as a pest. Uh, but it's very, very difficult to get rid of. And its stubborn persistence um, is like the stubborn persistence of the family in a tree grows in Brooklyn. That's why it's the central metaphor. But the tree of heaven doesn't come from Europe. It's originally from China. And here it is in its natural habitat. And in its natural habitat, it grows to be this absolutely majestic, majestic tree. Um, so there's a story here about native and immigrant trees that's to be told. And again, in the document I'll send out afterwards, if anyone wants to follow up more on the story of the tree of heaven, um, I've written um, a certain amount about it there. Here's another book that tells us a great deal about trees. The Lord of the Rings. If you haven't yet read it, now is the time, or maybe do your A-levels, and then that summer is the time. Wonderful book, wonderful book. And it's a wonderful book about trees as well. Tolkien loved trees and was very knowledgeable about them. And you see this particularly in the section about the Ents. And if you don't know who the Ents are, they are tree shepherds. They are very much like trees themselves. They speak very, very slowly. They grow to an immense age. Um, and when roused, they're incredibly strong. And uh, a couple of the hobbits blunder into the, uh, the realm of the Ents and get to know them. And there's a very poignant moment when the Ents talk about the Ent wives. They say, have you seen the Ent wives? The Ent wives have gone. They've lost, they've left us. And we can't find them again. And these Ents can no longer reproduce. And they're dying out as a result. It's very, very sad. Now that's just not a bit of 
um, fanciful fiction, Tolkien knew what he was talking about. And what he knew was that the small-leaved lime and the broad-leaved lime used to be the dominant species along with oak in this country. It used to, be, um, it used to swathe the country. But as the climate changed, it became very difficult for this tree to reproduce. And so now you only find it in very isolated um, clusters in local places. So this particular tree is in the Lake District, that's Coniston Water, you can see in the background, um, and it's growing by the side of a place called Selside Beck. It's a really beautiful tree, but it's a rather sad tree, because um, unless we get dramatic um, global warming, which may come our way, uh, this tree is doomed to be isolated and uh, unable to reproduce. Here's an ancient small leaf lime, a year later, almost exactly a year later, but after a, a much colder spring, so it's uh, not yet come out in, in leaf. Okay, so there's, there's trees. Now, we are very blessed with having some wonderful, wonderful trees on site here, but we don't tend to notice them so much. So when talking about um, these talks with Mrs Payne, she was very keen that we were able to follow up the talk rather than just listen to it and then forget about it. You know, how, can we, how can we build on what we hear in some of these talks? Over the last year, I've been keeping a nature journal, which I've really enjoyed. And on the first page of my nature journal, I've got this quotation from John Ruskin. I know that Mr Maunder is a great Ruskin fan. And I just think this is a wonderful quotation. Um, there you are, let me just read it for you. But the problem is that we don't often see. We, we keep our heads down, we're busy, we rush through the day. We don't put our heads up and really look. And so we need to find ways to do that. And so I just want to suggest now one or two ways in which we can do it. And the first way we can do it is by reverting to childhood. We can start thinking about climbing trees again. Now, before any of the senior management start to panic here, I'm not saying you should all go and climb the tallest tree you can find immediately after this talk. But just go and look. And go and look, think, oh, would that be a good tree to climb? During the uh, fire alarm yesterday, um, while everybody else was sort of moaning about how cold they were, I was uh, looking out at some glorious lime trees between Berwick and, um, and, and Marden. Go and have a look at them next time. You have to look up. When you look up, they are absolutely incredible. Um, so we need to look up, and one way of getting ourselves to look up is to start looking, well, wait a minute, could I climb this? Now, I've taken expert advice on this, and my children tell me that the uh, best trees to climb are laurel trees. So if you're on the lookout, I, I recommend laurel. Now, tree climbing, you know, you might think, I'm, I'm beyond that now, I'm, I'm, I'm 18, Mr. Peachy. Um, but actually, it's become quite respectable in recent years. Here's Robert McFarlane, and Robert McFarlane is a Cambridge academic. He's an English lecturer. Emmanuel College, um, and he's a great author. He's written some wonderful, wonderful books. He spends quite a lot of his time up trees. Um, so I think if it's good enough for Robert McFarlane, it's, it's good enough for us too. What else can we do? Well, another thing we can do is we can uh, try and paint or draw. Now, I am no artist. This is not my strength at all, but I really like sketching um, well, various different things, including trees, partly because it slows me down, it forces me to look. So here's a, a rather bedraggled looking tree outside E5, and this next one is my attempt to show the remarkable variety of greens that you get here at Waldingham. This is up by the swimming pool on that bench up there, looking down back over the school. Now I'm not, I'm not um, claiming that any of this is great art, but it does slow us down if we try and sketch, if we do try and paint. And it doesn't matter really how good we are at it. And maybe once we start to look um, in this way, maybe we'll start to see things we hadn't seen before. Uh, what do you notice about this tree, for example? Okay, it's rather strange at the top. And the reason it's rather strange at the top is because it's been pollarded. And pollarding is a way of harvesting the wood. So the tree has grown and then it's been chopped back at the top in order to um, get um, branches for all sorts of different things. Ash has been a particularly valuable tree um, for country folk for many, many years. 
and then it grows up again, and then it's harvested again, and then it grows up again, and then it's harvested again, leaving this rather distinctive shape at the top. Another way of doing much the same thing is coppicing. And here is an old coppice wood, where again, the trees have been uh, cut back, harvested, then they're allowed to grow again. Now this one has actually grown out, it hasn't been harvested for a while, which is why you've got these rather strange shapes. Now maybe we see these, maybe we see stuff like this in the school grounds, and yet we don't really see it. Maybe we notice it, maybe we don't. Maybe uh, now's the time to start looking for these sorts of things. One thing we might want to think about as a school, I would love us to be able to do this, but it is a big in undertaking, is to map the trees that we have on site. It's a huge task, but maybe we can start small. And there's this great programme called Treezilla, which is uh, linked to the Open University, and they're trying to map all the, tra all the trees in Britain. Um, and we, and it's a citizen science project, so um, they're, they're looking for people like you and me to go and do this. I, I've done this over lockdown with uh, my children, um, and it's, it's great fun just going down and trying to work out what the local trees are, um, measuring the size of their girth, and uh, entering them onto the website. Um, they have a great tree identification guide as well that comes with it. So if you're not too sure about the trees outside your boarding house or in your back garden, um, this is a good place to start. But I want to finish just by taking us up a, a, a different byway, a leafy byway. And it starts by introducing you to uh, this jolly chap here. Does anyone know who that is? Nope. Very good, Mr. Maunder. G.K. Chesterton, this is G.K. Chesterton. Now, G.K. Chesterton is a wonderful writer. He's, he's not nearly well enough known. Um, he wrote a huge amount of stuff, but at the heart of it all was this sense of wonder. He wanted us to be able to recapture a sense of wonder. Uh, there's a quotation from Chesterton actually on the, uh, the stone bench as you head up the Pergola Walk. Um, now, Chesterton wrote a really intriguing story, uh, this one here, in which a retired military man decides to go and live up a tree, up an elm tree in fact. And this elm tree was on Buxton Common near Purley. Now I found this intriguing, I thought, well, okay, where, where is this place? Uh, there is, as far as I'm aware, no such place as Buxton Common near Purley. So I started to do a bit of in, um, detective work to try and find out where Chesterton was thinking about. And in the story, they're trying to find this elusive um, army officer who's disappeared up his tree. And they go to Purley Station, and then they head south. And, as I say, there's no Buxton Common, but there are various... Oh, there's the, the book it's collected in, by the way. Um, there, are, there is no Buxton Common, but there are a few commons as you head south. There's Kenley Common. Um, up there on the top right is Riddlesdown Common. Those of you who come in by the train probably go right past it. Uh, there's Caulston Common. Um, so there are various places it could be. I think that Chesterton may well have had his... Um, may have well have used as his template for this. So, there is more work to be done, but I am going to claim this story for us. This seems to me our tree story, our local tree story, and I commend it to you. I could go on, I really could go on all day, but I'm going to spare you that and I'm going to stop now. We've got just a few minutes if you want to fire any questions at me. Um, bearing in mind that I'm not a biologist, um, but I'm very happy to take any questions, uh, thoughts, comments that you might have. Thank you ever so much for listening. It's Weatherson. Um, well, I do love the small leaf lime, um, the one I showed you from near Coniston, and I think part of it is kind of emotional, um, uh, a sort of emotional connection with it that comes from having studied, that's the one time I have studied trees actually, and I did a, a course at Lancaster University um, in Lake District Studies, um, uh, which has never got me a job, but is the best course I've ever done. And part of the reason it's the best course I've ever done is because most of the time we weren't at Lancaster, we were out in the field, we were studying in the Lake District. 
um, getting very wet often. But it was just glorious, and I just loved studying uh, these trees up by Coniston and, and various other things as well. So I, I love that tree. I, I do really like the Tree of Heaven. Um, again, partly I think it's the story of the underdog, but I think it's just a beautiful and majestic tree. Um, but there are so many, and so many more to explore. Yeah. It's, it is very tricky. It's certainly much easier in the summer. Um, but, again, once we start to look, there are, there are signs. I mean, the, the bark of trees is absolutely fascinating. If you think about the London Plain, for example. Okay, the London Plain is a fascinating tree. You see it a lot in London and other cities because its bark peels off. Okay, it comes off in strips. And therefore, it's very good at dealing with pollution. That's why it's planted so often in, in big cities and that's where the name comes from. Um, the London Plain is intriguing actually because it's actually a hybrid tree made up of, um, which comes from the Oriental Plain and the American Plain. Okay, it's, not, it's not from London at all, it's actually a, it's a foreigner if you like. Um, so, but the, the bark there is very, very distinctive as is the case in, in many trees. Um, the way the, the, uh, the twigs form as well um, uh, can be distinctive but nonetheless it is true that it is very tricky in the winter uh, we're just about okay now there's still just about leaves on some of the trees um, so if you get out quick you could just about do it any final question come on fire something difficult at me or be kind and fire some easy question to finish okay Okay, that isn't already here. Well, is it? Is it? yeah, it's very difficult to know what's already here, so we've got so much. But um, ginkgo trees are very interesting. I love ginkgo trees. Uh, the, the leaf of the ginkgo tree is very, very distinctive, very different from anything else you're likely to see. Just, probably not now, but just a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, ginkgos with beautiful, beautiful yellow colour, really glorious. And the ginkgo tree is very interesting because as a, a type of tree, it's, it's incredibly ancient. Um, millions of years, you know, virtually the most ancient. Uh, so I think it's the second most ancient tree we've got. Um, so I think I think we could do with a ginkgo tree or two. Yes. There we are. Can, I'll put that to um, this weather saying you've got power. Ginkgo tree is what we're after. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. This is the start of a process. Um, I would be delighted. Okay, those of you in the audience and those of you watching online, um, if students, you could put yourselves forward to give a, a talk as well. Um, we are really looking for people who are enthusiastic about something that you might think is just a private passion that might not be of any interest to anyone else. Uh, if you come up and speak about it and you uh, are genuinely interested, other people will come along with you. So if you're interested in giving a talk, let me know, send me an email or come and chat to me. Um, and we'll see what we can fit in during the year. Thank you very much.